Welcome to the Institute for International and European Affairs here in Dublin, and a very special welcome to our guest speaker today, Mehmed Uluçu. Today's webinar is on the fascinating topic, post-election Turkey, the implications for Europe. And some of you may recall that The Economist magazine this year described at what was then the forthcoming elections as the most important in uh, 2023. Our formal presentation will last about 20 minutes, and this will be followed by a discussion, which you, the audience, can join by using the Q&A function on your screen. Feel free to send in questions or comments during the opening statement, and we will come to them later. We ask that you give your name and any relevant organizations of which you are affiliated when putting a question or comment. Both the keynote statement and the Q&A are on the record, and feel free to join the discussion on Twitter with the handle at IIEA. Now, it's a great pleasure uh, to formally introduce Mehmet Uluçu, who currently chairs the Global Resources Partnership, a London-based strategic investment advisory group in the natural resources and energy sectors. Earlier in a distinguished and varied career, Mehmet worked as an advisor to the then Turkish Prime Minister, Turget Uzal. He also held a number of important postings in the Turkish Foreign Service. As well as working in the OECD and the International Energy Agency Secretariats, he has extensive experience of the private sector, most notably in the energy field. Mehmet, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mary. Thank you very much. It's really a privilege uh, to be joining you today at uh, IIEA, and uh, I would like to share some of the thoughts that I have about how the post-election uh, Turkey would be interacting with Europe and also wider region, including uh, Middle East, Russia, uh, China, and uh, Central Asia, as well as uh, ISMED. More importantly, of course, we have to look at how Turkish relations with the European Union will evolve. And uh, because, as you said, the elections we had uh, on 14 and 28 May, uh, first tour and the second round were critical uh, and the most important election in 2023, as the economists also put it, because it wasn't going to affect Turkish domestic politics only. It's a game changer in many respects, but it also has significant implications for the region surrounding Turkey. And if you look at Turkey's relations with uh, Middle East, Gulf nations, Eurasia, is met even down to uh, Black Africa and Latin America, Turkey has made great inroads in these regions as a positive force to reckon with or as a disruptor. So it depends on from which angle we look at it. And uh, of course, in the European Union and most of the liberal parts of the Turkish society, there was a strong conviction that uh, Erdogan came to the end of his political career. Many people thought that it will be an overwhelming majority by the opposition leaders. So things was, were going to change in a significant way. And Erdogan won the election at the second round by a small margin though. And there were some, of course, concerns whether irregularities. It wasn't a fair election in terms of opposition having the airtime in TV, radios, media, and uh, also lots of uh, obstructions, legal and practical administrative obstructions uh, on the way to opposition. And still many people consider that opposition having around 48%, almost half of the population against Erdogan, uh, is a game. However, the reality is that now the President Erdogan will be running, if his health allows, for the next uh, five years. And then we have the local election coming on the 31st of March, eight and a half months from now worse, and opposition is in disarray, demoralized, because they couldn't achieve what they were hoping to have, and uh, therefore, there are so much divisions now within the opposition. This table of six already disintegrated. So there was a single united uh, opposition front against Erdogan. No longer we can talk of that. 
whether they will collaborate again during the uh, local elections. And it is still doubtful. Leaderships have not changed yet of CHP or a good party or other opposition groups because clearly they were defeated, no matter whether it was by a small margin or not. And um, now I think uh, opposition is bittering uh, among themselves uh, without any due respect to the elections, local elections coming. And Erdogan's first statement was, I will get back Istanbul and Ankara because without Istanbul and Ankara, Erdogan doesn't feel comfortable. And so uh, we also discuss uh, among ourselves uh, whether uh, there will be any uh, change in Erdogan's policies, domestic, economic, or foreign policy uh, approaches uh, the way Erdogan appealed and applied uh, all along and what we think is that economy is in deep um, recession there are serious problems cash problems the treasury central bank reserves are depleted even to the minus 70 billion dollars um, uh, therefore uh, we uh, think that it is not sustainable the way he ran the Turkish economy up to now. Interest rates were so low, inflation high, you know, about uh, central bank base rate was about 8.5% and the inflation were around 80%. So Erdogan was claiming to follow an unorthodox economic policy, which uh, created serious difficulties for individuals who lost their savings, as well as the companies who borrowed heavily from abroad. Now there is a new team, and when you look at the composition of Erdogan's cabinet in the post-election period, it is quite respected, uh, including myself. I find it quite pragmatic and well-chosen uh, people on the basis of their merits. Now, economy czar is Mehmet Shimshek, who came from UK, from London. He was a former economy minister. He was called back because he's well-respected in international markets. And central bank governor, a lady who came from the United States, and then now Erdogan had to accept grudgingly that interest rates should go up, inflation should be kept under control, and uh, central bank shouldn't sell all the currencies they have in order to control the uh, uh, dollar, uh, euro, and pounds uh, in the country. So when you look at it from the EU perspective, I was in Palermo, and one of my colleagues from a uh, uh, French strategic institute, he told me that we were really scared that opposition candidate might win. Because if he wins, we have to revise our policy vis-a-vis -vis Turkey. So we have to welcome uh, the new opposition leader, and that means revitalization of Turkish-EU relations. I don't know whether this is a feeling widely held in EU circles, but uh, from the EU perspective, Turkey is right now a power uh, disrupting the uh, neighborhood um, security policy uh, issues and quite a uh, ambitious, aspiring uh, nation, uh, upsetting all the well-established balances and status quo. And uh, also Turkey is the gateway for millions of refugees coming from Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, and you name it. And um, also, I mean, the uh, human rights violations, democratic gaps, credentials, and they were all seen as a result uh, to perhaps reduce the level of EU engagement with Turkey, limiting it only to transactions, vital transactions. And in Ismet, of course, and Cyprus, the problems are still going on. And EU had to take sides in Cyprus and Ismet because uh, South Cyprus and uh, Greece are members, and Turkey is not. Uh, Turkish membership in the EU is a long saga, uh, more than half a century, and it hasn't happened. There are, I think, uh, blames that can be put on Ankara and Brussels equally. But right now, uh, what we see is that the accession talks started in 2004, 
official uh, negotiations stopped. It's not going anywhere since 2018. And again, on the account of uh, democracy deficit in Turkey and also Turkish action vis-a-vis -vis Cyprus, Greece, ISMAD. And therefore, there is no trust on both sides. And the EU's interest is focusing only on the refugee issues, give Turkey more money so that they can stop the flow of uh, refugees uh, to Europe. But the price Turkey had to pay was almost 13 million refugees, migrants, coming and staying in Turkey in a population of 85 million. This is a huge burden. And the EU thought that just pay a couple of billions of euros, perhaps Turkey could be satisfied, but this created a huge problem in Turkey, as it did for some of the European countries, including Greece, I think. And, uh, but the uh, relationship are now focused uh, only on areas where EU has vital interest. And EU investments to Turkey slow down significantly. FDI is almost at the level of nil, uh, zero. And to the contrary, Turkish capital is outflowing to European financial markets and also greenfield opportunities that they can find. So it's an unbalanced relationship. And this is not sustainable, of course, uh, because we also have the customs union. And then there was a suggestion from the EU side under the positive agenda with Turkey, perhaps customs union could be modernized to make sure that agriculture and services could be included in the um, customs union. Then freedom of movement, of course, because EU has provided visa-free access to many nations uh, who didn't even be around with EU, whereas Turkey with a, a commitment to relationship more than 50 years with ups and downs were not given this right. So there was fear that there will be flow of people from Turkey to EU uh, markets. So I think the mutual distrust is in place. There are many efforts to revive this relationship, but the accession, full accession is no longer on the table. I mean, de jure, it's there, but de facto, nobody's talking about it. Even in Turkey, they say, uh, without joining EU, if there is a referendum, there will be a Turk exit uh, rather than uh, like the Brexit. And Turks wouldn't like to join EU uh, because they see EU, perhaps it's rhetorical, but you know, a, a group of nations uh, which lost competitiveness, aging, and also have little say in the global affairs also, although it's a huge economy, but in terms of impact in the global system, EU is not uh, performing well, and it's not a power to be envy of. This is what the Turkish populist uh, rhetoric is. And instead, if you don't want to work with me, if you limit your uh, engagement uh, to only critical transactions like refugee issues, energy, climate change, then of course, we will look for other opportunities, they say. And Russia comes into the picture in that context. Because Erdogan and Putin somehow have a personal chemistry develop. And there is some sort of relationship, even we don't understand how it works, because it doesn't look like it is from state to state, it's more personal, the, uh, you know, the uh, grain deal from Ukraine. Then energy-wise, of course, Turkey depends heavily on Russia, and we haven't in Turkey adopted the sanctions that EU and US pushed for, and uh, because Turkey itself is under some, of the, some sort of sanctions. And China is also trying to court Turkey. And my concern is that if Turkey is excluded from the European Union, as a measure power, it's also already part of the OECD and NATO, the second largest army within NATO. There is a risk that Turkey could be um, moving towards Russia and China. If there is going to be a new cleavage in the international system, not the Cold War, as we have seen before 1990s, but uh, this kind of a new cleavage between uh, Russia, China, and their allies and the West on the other side, where Turkey will sit, because Turkey always wanted to play a balancing role 
in the geography where it's located, because Turkey is the only power now able to speak to Putin, Xi Jinping, and Biden, and the European leaders, and Middle Eastern and Gulf leaders as well. Therefore, there is a need for a country, perhaps, to play a bridging role where it works, or we exaggerate it. And so one has to look uh, how realistic it is. But current picture shows that uh, Turkey needs Europe, of course, for economical reasons. Also, there are about 5 million Turks living in European Union territory. And that's the size of a country almost, uh, if you look around Cyprus, Malta, and other Luxembourg. Therefore, I think there is a need for a win-win partnership. We shouldn't perhaps poison the relationship on insisting on accession, which is not going to take place soon. Perhaps it's a matter for the next generation. So we should perhaps put this aside and focus on where both sides could work together on the basis of equality and uh, also mutual benefit. And Turkish relations with Russia will not change for the foreseeable future. Of course, it depends on who will sit in Moscow, whether uh, Putin will survive uh, the crisis that we are going through. Uh, there was a little hope in certain capitals that uh, the Wagner uh, uprising could perhaps uh, destabilize Moscow somehow, but I think it has been sort of uh, resolved for the time being. And China, of course, is very careful. And through uh, Belt and Road Initiative, it made huge gains and inroads in Central Asia, in Southeast Europe as well, and in Africa, in Middle East, and the Saudi uh, energy interests tie it more and more with Beijing rather than US or European Union countries. So the energy flows will be changing as a result of sanctions on Russia for natural gas and price ceilings, caps for uh, oil and oil products. Now more and more oil is flowing from Russia to China and India. Likewise, uh, Saudis are selling more and more to the Asia Pacific nations and uh, LNG going from Qatar, Tanzania, Australia, more and more towards China, India, Japan, Taiwan, Pakistan, rather than to Europe, because Europe is not willing to pay um, long term for long term contracts. They prefer um, uh, short term uh, needs. And European energy architecture, supply architecture significantly change. There might be need for Turkey to step in there as well, because Turkish energy security is so much linked to Russia, but also to the European Union. And Turkey could be a gateway for energy flows, not only for oil, natural gas, but also in the renewables, because Turkey now has, um, in terms of uh, power capacity, 54% of Turkish energy electricity comes uh, from renewables and green hydrogen and you name it, climate change wise. There, there are lots of areas to work together. So um, looking at this uh, pictures, not looking so positive, I think there is need for an effort from Brussels and EU capitals to decide what to do with Turkey. It cannot continue business as usual because Turkey now is a power to reckon with. It's the largest regional power from China to, Aus to Germany, from Russia to Saudi Arabia. It's a huge geographical space in which Turkey economically, politically, militarily play a key role. And EU, of course, may continue its current policy, but down the road, a couple of years later, then the question will be asked, who lost Turkey? I think one has to be prepared for such scenarios. Ship dialogue, short of accession, uh, but win-win rather than only serving the EU interest. I think there is a risk that Turkey might be tilting towards other uh, powers, global powers, in the new international order that is emerging. And uh, so I think uh, the question that you posed for this uh, session is a very meaningful one. What will be the implications of 
post-election Turkey. And we have to take a very strategic and long-term view on Turkey, rather than focusing on, of course, difficulties, uh, deficiencies that Turkey has. And so let me stop here. Perhaps we might have uh, provocative questions that can uh, help me to be more provocative as well.